I want you to hit me as hard as you can. The early 80s were a magical time on television. I personally think it was one of the most inventive and crazy anything goes decades when it came to TV. There were a number of these shows hitting our TV screens at the time. Sadly, not all of the series from the heydays of Neon and Synthwave made it past one season. One of those, oh my god, they really had a show about this on network TV series was one of my favorites growing up, Manimal. Yes, that's the actual name, youngins, and it was awesome. There was some major talent behind the camera and in front. The series was a melding of sci-fi, fantasy, mystery, crime, and just, well, a bit of everything all rolled into one. So on this episode of Gone But Not Forgotten, we're going to be remembering the show that gave us the man who could have been Bond but instead became a... Manable. Thanks for taking time to watch Gone But Not Forgotten. If you like our show, please hit subscribe to our channel right now. Hit the like button and don't forget to click on the bell to be notified each time a video goes up. Now, back to the show. Animal was the creation of classic TV pioneer Glenn A. Larson and Donald R. Boyle. The concept was an ambitious one for a network TV series and also unique in a range of shows that would include Auto Man and Misfits of Science. NBC seemed to be one network not afraid of taking chances when it came to a different sort of series, and Manimal would find itself on that list of odd shows of the 80s. The pilot would air at the end of September in 1983. The story would follow debonair professor Jonathan Chase, who, and we're not really clear on the details here, has the power to shapeshift into any animal in the Wild Kingdom. We're shown this via flashback, where young Jonathan's dying father passes along to Jonathan the secrets of his abilities. Like any good Jedi, his father simply disappears, leaving only his clothes behind. Again, we're never really clear on how Jonathan or his father learned these abilities, but it had something to do with his time in Africa and possibly a tribe training him on these techniques. Chase uses these powers for good, and becomes a doctor of what appears to be psychology and something to do with animal behavior. He also becomes a police consultant due to his expertise in behavior patterns, namely how animals can help us better understand criminals, which is sort of a slam on animals now that I come to think about it. Chase runs into policewoman Brooke McKenzie when she pulls over a suspicious truck running late at night. Both Chase and McKenzie are investigating an operation that is linked to this vehicle. In the process, McKenzie's partner is shot. Chase is also shot, while in the form of a Black Panther. No, not, not that Black Panther. An actual Black Panther. Viewers soon find that the Black Panther is a sort of go-to for Chase when it comes to changing shapes. McKenzie finds Chase in his evening finest after changing back to his human form. He leaves the scene only for Brooke to attend his course the next day on the criminal mind. Chase plays dumb when it comes to being recognized, but Brooke McKenzie isn't blind and soon figures out, yeah, he's the same man. The two join forces to take down the group who it turns out are trying to steal a chemical nerve gas to sell to the highest bidder. Eventually, Brooke learns the truth about Jonathan and his powers as they stop the group. The rest of the series focuses on Brooke, Jonathan, and Jonathan's driver slash assistant Ty solving crimes and stopping bad guys, usually as a panther or a hawk. No, not that hawk. The pilot episode sets up how the series will play out over future episodes. Jonathan Chase takes the form of a hawk panther, and infrequently other creatures in order to solve the case that they are dealing with that week, or to spy on the bad guys. In this episode, one particular standout is when he becomes a fluffy white kitty that manages to shove its head into guest star Ursula Andress's bathrobe cleavage, which was about as subtle as an anvil hitting you on the head. They also involved quite a lot of deep breathing. 
a lot of it. But somehow Jonathan Chase, unlike David Banner, manages to have his clothes intact after he changes, even when he rips them apart. And these aren't just t-shirts and jeans, these are nice tuxedos and scarfs. Jonathan Chase knows how to dress, and his magic animal powers apparently include creating Louis Vuitton from thin air. In regards to Brooke, we see her get knocked unconscious or beat up quite a bit, which tends to be another trend of the show. You can play a drinking game for the pilot, but it might just kill you depending on what you're drinking. Tyrone, Jonathan's right-hand man, plays the stalwart assistant buddy that was a cornerstone of many 80s series at this time. While you could say this was formulaic, Manimal was just weird enough to make things different. Simon McCorkendale brought a seriousness and yet playful side to Jonathan Chase. McCorkendale was the epitome of the dashing British lead. He was handsome, had a great voice, and a regality about him. This would serve him well when he filmed The Sword and the Sorcerer, playing Prince Micah. This was a year prior to being cast in the lead role of Manimal. Simon liked the role and took it seriously as he saw the character as a smart and intelligent man. McCorkendale worked hard during filming. It was very long days for everyone, but even more so for our lead actor. He would have to come in on weekends to shoot the special effects sequences for the transformations. While there were a lot of beautiful, blonde, and female leads that were on TV at the time, most of them named Heather, Melody Anderson stood out. Having played Dale Arden in Flash Gordon only a couple of years prior, Anderson brought that same presence to Manimal. Glenn Turman would play Ty in the pilot only. The role would be recast for the rest of the series with Michael D. Roberts playing the role. Roberts was a familiar face to TV viewers, appearing in a number of shows, many of them created by Glenn Larson like Knight Rider. But if you love obscure 80s sci-fi like I do, you'll know him as Roscoe from Ice Pirates, who is there when we learn that there is such a thing as space herpes. Space herpes. Behind the scenes though, the big star was special effects master Stan Winston, who created the creature effects and transformations from Manimal. For the times, and for a television series budget, they were pretty fantastic. Yes, the show would reuse many of the same shots for multiple transformations during the episodes, but it didn't matter because to me and a lot of kids from the 80s, this was just really cool. Stan's work was very groundbreaking, and while the FX master himself may have passed away in 2008, his name and work carry on with the Stan Winston School, which helps mold new generations of special effects creators and even has online classes. It was co-founded by Stan's son, Matt Winston. Stan was a huge proponent of referencing nature whenever possible to ensure the realism of the characters and creatures that came out of his studio. Even if a character was meant to be a completely fantastical and not of this earth, Stan believed that grounding their design and execution in real-world anatomy, as well as natural textures and color patterns, would make them more believable to an audience. For Manimal, Stan and his team did copious research on Black Panthers and Hawks to help pull off these transformation sequences as realistically as possible. To design Simon McCorkendale's transformations from man to animal, Stan started by sketching a likeness of Simon. From there, he drew a series of approximately 10 transformation images in both front and profile views. Each sketch progressively changed Simon's features into that of either a hawk or a panther. Once he was happy with this 2D preview of how the transformation would unfold, Stan used a life cast of Simon's head and face as the starting point and then, with the assistance of his team, sculpted each phase of his transformation separately in clay. Some of the early stages were achieved by applying a prosthetics makeup to Simon, but at a certain point, the stages were executed by doing camera dissolves between a series of articulated puppet heads, each more animalistic than the previous head in the sequence. Although this isn't as much the case today, film projects in the early 80s tended to have bigger budgets and more prep time than television projects. But with Manimal, Stan was given nearly four months to create all the makeups and puppet effects that were necessary. 
On top of that, Stan was then given the opportunity to direct the transformation sequences himself from every conceivable angle and against the blue screen so that the same transformations could be recut and reused in future episodes of the show with different backgrounds composited in. Stan, like all makeup and creature effects artists, was always a huge fan of werewolves and other lycanthropic creatures. Working on Manimal gave him the opportunity to tackle two ambitious transformations from man to animal, and although the series was short-lived, it allowed him to push the creative envelope and develop advanced puppetry techniques that he would apply to future projects for years to come. If you are interested in the school, we highly recommend that you visit their webpage at www.stanwinstonschool.com. As I've already mentioned Ursula Andress's robe cleavage, let's talk about another aspect of Manimal, the guest stars. Like many of Larson's other series, such as Buck Rogers, Manimal had guest stars every week that would typically play the villains. Ursula Andress, of course, was an international movie star and had been a Bond girl, which was ironic as McCorkendale had been in the running to replace Roger Moore in the role of James Bond in the mid-80s. Her casting was quite a way to start the series. In the same episode, Terry Kaiser, Bernie himself, would also be on the criminal side. Future episodes would include seasoned villains like Richard Lynch, David Hess, and Robert Englund. Doug McClure and James Hong would also guest star. Manimal didn't fare well out of the gate. This wasn't all due to the strange concept of, well, a show named Manimal. NBC released it as a bit of extreme counter-programming to Dallas. Yes, Dallas. One of the biggest TV series of the 80s and king of all nighttime soaps. Manimal was given the dreaded Friday night death slot. Manimal lasted a grand total of eight episodes before it was canceled, barely two and a half months after it premiered. While Manimal may not have been a massive hit here in the States, Overseas, it did actually pretty good. In the UK, Manimal even got what is called an annual. It only got one, of course, but these are children's books. They include comics, games, and bits about a show and are created for series as successful as Doctor Who. There was even a very odd toy line released which featured animals with human-like features. I actually own these, and I swear I couldn't tell you where I got them when I was a kid, but that snake one was my favorite. There was even an action figure of Chase himself, made by LJN that came with him as his trusty favorites, Hawk and Panther. Manimal became a bit of a joke at the time. David Letterman actually had an ongoing routine when it was still up in the air if the show would be coming back, even though everyone pretty much knew it wasn't going to. So Manimal really will never come back? Nope. Not, not on another network, not in syndication, not in home cassettes? Nowhere. Nowhere. It's a ghost. It's, it's a history. Ghost. It's vapor. It's vapor. But you can't keep a good Manimal down, and the same could be said for Glenn Larson, who kept creating shows right up until he passed away at the age of 77 in 2014. Larson seemed to have a love for the weird and strange, and that's how the series Nightman happened in 1997. Based off the comic of the same name, Nightman followed Johnny Domino, a sax player who gets struck by lightning and gets superpowers at the cost of never being able to sleep again. Yes, it's as strange as you remember. But things got even stranger or more awesome if you're like me when in the second season, Nightman had a crossover episode with freaking Manimal. The episode was, unsurprisingly, called Manimal and Simon McCorkendale returned as Jonathan Chase, who now can travel through time, who is chasing Jack the Ripper, who is trying to kill Chase's daughter, and who also can turn into animals just like Dad. And you thought Manimal couldn't get more out there. You should be ashamed. It seems like Larson was trying to get a spin-off return show for Manimal with this episode, which would focus on Teresa, his daughter who was played by Carly Pope, but it was not to be. Simon McCorkendale would continue to have quite a lot of success after Manimal. He would produce, 
direct, and star in a number of series and films, including Falcon Crest and Counter-Strike. Of course, there was Jaws 3D where his hand saved the day, and you'll not get me to think otherwise. Sadly, he would be diagnosed with bowel cancer at the young age of 54. He kept working, even when he got the news that it had spread to his lungs. He would pass away in 2010 at the age of 58. Manimal in the years since has become a cult favorite and has had a few DVD releases over the years of the full eight episodes of the series in other countries. In 2015, Shout Factory finally gave the North American audiences the full series in a great set. So, as we always ask, should Manimal come back? Well, that was actually supposed to happen in a way back in 2012. Prior to his death, Larson was working with Will Ferrell and Adam McKay on a film version which would have most likely not been a serious version of the story. But there's been no sort of activity around the project since this bit of news. Personally, I would love to see a Manimal series on cable, one that would possibly be a bit darker but still with that suave Jonathan Chase. Think Daniel Craig Bond but with claws. Chase could be working for the CIA, Interpol, or the FBI hunting down endangered animal smugglers. This practically screams for a Tiger King vs. Manimal type of scenario. Oh god, I need this to happen. But seriously, I could see this working in terms of a reboot with Chase using his abilities to take down human rights violators and animal rights violators as well. But when it comes to the special effects and transformations, it would only be right to do them practically. You can't CGI the man out of the Manimal. It just wouldn't be the same. I changed shapes just to hide in this place, but I'm still, I'm still an animal. Nobody knows it but me when I slip, yeah, I slip, I'm still an